Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I sat in the hospital waiting room, wondering if I should stay or if I should leave. Part of me wanted to run, far away, and let the cheating witch wonder where I was. But I had to confront her one last time. Let me back up a bit. My name is Mike Gregory. I'm a CPA for the accounting firm of Thomas and McMaster. I've been married to Jenny for just under five years, but that would be changing very soon. After I graduated from high school, I enlisted in the Marine Corps and was made a dispersing clerk. I was one of the guys who made sure our Marines got paid. It wasn't a glamorous or thrill-packed job by any stretch of the imagination, but I loved working with numbers. Liars can figure, but figures don't lie. And I liked that part of my job. After my stint in the Corps was over, I went into the reserves and finished my bachelor's degree in accounting. I had started my education while in the service, so it only took three years for me to finish my degree and meet the state requirements for a CPA license. I met Jenny in my senior year of college. She was working to become a paralegal and had hoped to become a lawyer at some point in time. We met, dated, and married the September after graduating from college. I started working for Thomas and McMaster, and she went to work for the law firm of Johnson & Associates, a company that specialized in family law. Things were great for the first four years, or so I had thought. Jenny knew that I would be gone for reserve drill one weekend out of the month and two weeks out of the year, and she was okay with that. Fortunately, I never got sent overseas after becoming a reservist, but I knew there was a possibility it could happen. Our life together during that time was terrific. We loved each other and had mind-blowing sex several times a week. We had rented a nice apartment and was thinking about buying a house and starting our family. Things began to go off the rails after the fourth anniversary of our marriage. Jenny began going out on Fridays after work, allegedly with the girls, to blow off steam. I didn't think too much of it and didn't complain, since I would sometimes go golfing with some of the guys from the office. At first, she was always home by 7.30 or 8 p.m., and we would spend the rest of the night making love. As time went on, though, she began getting home later and later. One time, she didn't even get home until 7 a.m. the next day, claiming that she spent the night with one of her friends rather than risk driving home drunk. A call to the friend's house confirmed that, and we went to the bar to pick up her car. Of course, the friend could have been lying to cover for her, but I had no real proof of that. I was rather pissed and told Jenny if it happened again to call me and I would pick her up and bring her home. Yeah, whatever, she said with a wave of her hand. That was the beginning of the end for us. Jenny became more dismissive, more disrespectful, telling me I had no right to ask what she was doing outside of work or the home. True, I didn't own her, but it seemed to me that if she really loved me, she would at least let me know where she would be so I wouldn't get worried. I also noticed that her clothing, what there was of it, was often disheveled when she came home from these outings, and she frequently smelled of cologne and something else. She would rush into the shower as soon as she got home and, of course, she was too tired to have sex on those nights. Being a CPA, I also took care of all our accounts and our bills. Jenny and I both had our checks deposited directly into our checking accounts. 10% of what we made went into a savings account for a house and other thing. Things were normal for the first four years, but I began to notice some changes in her spending habits. For example, I noticed that she began buying sexy lingerie at Victoria's Secret and Club wear from some of those online companies, but I never saw what she had purchased. I asked her about the purchases, but she dismissed my questions, telling me to mind my own business. I don't mind you buying nice things, I said, but I haven't seen any of this stuff. What are you doing with it? None of your business, she said haughtily. None of my business? What the hell? I also noticed that her salary didn't seem to increase on the fourth anniversary of her employment with the firm. I asked her about it, but she just blew me off. No, I didn't get a raise, she claimed. No one did. Things have been a bit slow lately. Of course, I knew that was a lie, because our firm did the year-end audits for a number of companies, including Johnson & Associates, and I knew the law firm's revenues had increased significantly over the previous year. I made a note to look deeper into this when I got to work. Then there was the end-of-year holiday party at her work. I always thought of this as Christmas, but her firm decided to be politically correct and call it a holiday party instead. Whatever. At first, Jenny tried to talk me out of going, which raised red flags. I know you really don't like being around my coworkers, so why don't you just stay home this year? She asked. After all, you really don't want to be around a bunch of stuffy old lawyers. Maybe I just want to spend the evening with you, I said. She sighed and shrugged her shoulders. Well, okay, 
if you insist, she said. But I intend to spend time with my colleagues and I can't have you hanging all over me all night. What? What do you mean? Spend time with your colleagues? I asked. Don't you see them every day at work? And during your evenings out? Well, I might get asked to dance with some of them, she said. Okay. I said. You have room on your dance card for your husband? She rolled her eyes and sighed again. I guess I can squeeze you in somewhere, she said. Well, don't force it, I said. We went to the party, and I hardly saw her the entire evening. She introduced me to a few of her co-workers as her pencil-pushing ball and chain, and ran off to dance with one man after another. Her co-workers looked at me with pity, and hardly no one spoke to me. I never did get a chance to dance with her, and I noticed that she had left the party more than once, coming back some time later with some guy grabbing her bum. If I didn't know any better, I could have sworn she had screwed one or more of them. Okay. I'm ready to go, she finally said, slurring her words. She was clearly drunk and her clothing and makeup looked disheveled. I grunted and headed out to the car. She followed and tried to kiss me when she got inside, but I pushed her away, noticing something foul about her breath. What's the matter? She asked. Your breath reeks, I said. What have you been drinking? She giggled. Wouldn't you like to know? She asked. I couldn't help but notice that you couldn't even bother to give your husband a dance, but you spent the whole night with everyone else. I said. Yeah, so what? She asked, getting perturbed. I also noticed that you were gone a lot, I said. Where did you go? She laughed. That's none of your business, she said. Nothing more was said the rest of the trip home. Naturally, there was no sex for us that night. Jenny tried to make up for her attitude during the rest of the holiday, but I could tell things weren't what they used to be. After the holiday season, Jenny went back to being a witch. Our sex life went from several times a week to maybe once a week, if that. Her time out with the girls increased and her attitude towards me only got worse. A couple of weeks after the holiday party, I spoke to George Wilson, the accountant who headed up the annual review of Johnson & Associates and learned that everyone in the firm had been given a huge bonus and a significant pay increase. Jenny, for example, had received a 30% increase in her salary and a $10,000 bonus. But none of that money was deposited in our account. What the hell was she doing with it? I thought about asking her but decided against it. With her attitude, I figured she would only lie about it and use my inquiry as an excuse to start an argument. So I asked George if he could dig into it a bit and get back to me. He assured me he wouldn't ask me to give him a couple days. Two days later, things went to hell in a handbasket. George came by my office and showed me some of what he had found. The records we had from their firm indicated that Jenny had her increase automatically deposited in an account she set up with another bank. I wondered about this but realized that she was apparently planning to leave me. He also told me they had found some irregularities in the company's books that could cause some problems. I made note of the account and thanked George for looking into it. That afternoon, my phone buzzed, letting me know I had received an email in my personal account. The subject read, What your wife is doing behind your back. Opening it, I saw a video attached. That video was the end of my marriage. I recognized the players as soon as I opened the video. One of them was Jenny, and she was completely naked. She was seen having sex with another man. It was bad enough seeing my wife screwing another man. And no, it didn't excite me in the least. Their words cut me to the bone and filled me with a rage that could only be described as murderous. Oh yes, baby, Demi, she said. Is this better than your dork husband? Way better. He can't even get it up. Maybe I should knock you up, he said. She laughed. Do it. I'll make my a-hole husband think it's his. He won't know any better. You going to keep screwing everyone else at the company, the way you've been doing for the last few months? Not if you get me pregnant. Come on, fill me up. I want to make my stupid husband a cuck. I stopped the video, unable to watch any more. I looked at the email to determine who sent it, hoping it was just a sick joke. I sent a reply. Who are you? And when did this happen? A few minutes later, I received a response. I'm Tracy Williams, the wife of the a-hole in the video, and I know your wife. This happened yesterday. Do you wish to meet? If so, call me at triple XXXXX. Of course, I wanted to meet. I had a million questions. How long had this been going on, for starters? This video explained quite a bit of what had been happening between us the last few months. I took down her number and called. Hello, a female voice said. Is this Mr. Gregory? Yes, I said. Please call me Mike. Is this Tracy? It is, she said. I take it you've watched the video. Some of it, I said. I want to meet and find out what's going on. Okay, she said. Meet me at the Starbucks around the corner from your office. 
20 minutes. I'll be there, I said, ending the call. I closed down my workstation and headed out, telling my secretary I would be gone for a while. It took me 10 minutes to get to the Starbucks, so I ordered coffee and waited. A few minutes later, an attractive woman entered the shop. She looked around and came over when she spotted me. I invited her to sit down and offered to buy a cup of coffee after we introduced ourselves to each other. After getting her order, she pulled a manila envelope out of her large handbag and gave it to me. Everything you need to know is right here, she said. I looked inside. In addition to photographs, there was a report put together by a private investigator and a flash drive. The flash drive has videos, more photographs, and a digital copy of the report. I'm sorry you had to learn about their affair like this. How long has this been going on? I asked, my heart breaking. At least four months that I know of, she said. Maybe longer. I know she's been with several others at her firm. That's also in the report. Just out of curiosity, why are you telling me all this? I asked. Because I intend to name your wife in my divorce, and that affects you, she said. Besides, I thought you should know. That is, if you haven't already figured it out. I've suspected something for quite a while, but I didn't have any real proof, I told her. So what are you planning to do? I've already told John that if I ever caught him cheating that I was going to divorce him, she said. Like you, I've suspected for a while, but I didn't have any real proof. I caught him once before and threatened divorce, but he warned me that if I did, his firm would destroy me. You know of their reputation, right? I've heard Jenny talk about how they often destroy spouses they go up against, I said. Frankly, I was amazed at some of the things Jenny told me about their firm. I was even more amazed by the fact that so far, they had gotten away with what they had done. When is their motto, she said. By any means necessary. So you're going through with it this time, I said. She nodded her head. I am, she said. Now that I have ironclad proof of his infidelity. It was my turn to nod. So what do you want from me? I asked. Nothing, she said. I just wanted to do the right thing. Not even a bit of revenge? I asked. Nope, she said. No offense. You seem like a great guy, but until this is done, I'm not going to do anything to screw it up. I nodded my head in understanding. No offense taken, I said. I understand completely. In fact, she added, I don't think we should see or speak to each other again until it's all over. I had a whole new respect for this woman. That makes sense, I said. Thank you for this information. She stood up and prepared to leave. You're welcome, Mike. Again, I'm sorry, she said. She reached in her purse and handed me a business card. This is my attorney's name and number. She's a real shark, and she's expecting to hear from you. I took the card and thanked her. I considered everything she told me and was dying to know what was on the flash drive. I called the office and took the afternoon off, then walked to the parking garage and headed home. When I got home, I went straight to my personal computer and inserted the flash drive. There were several videos on the drive, all of them showing Jenny engaging in very explicit acts with different men, including John Williams. Some of them showed Jenny with John and at least one other man. A scene in one video made me sick to my stomach. The camera caught Jenny going into the bathroom. She didn't bother closing the door for privacy as she normally did. As I watched, she took off her rings and urinated on them as she sat on the toilet. I could hear John laughing. Damn, you're one nasty witch, he said. I hope you wash those things before you put them back on. She laughed. Yeah, I will, she said, putting the soiled rings on the sink. Besides, the only time I ever wear them is when the loser is around. Why don't you just divorce him if you think so little of him? John asked. She shrugged her shoulders. I still like him a little bit. Besides, it's more fun doing this behind his back, she said. Maybe one day I'll have you, and the guys come over, and we can make him watch us have sex. Maybe we can set him up like we do some of the other guys we go up against, and then destroy him completely. You want to make him your willing cuck? John asked. She smiled. He won't like it at first, she said. He'll probably fight it for a while, but once he realizes just how much damage we can do to him and his reputation, he'll give in. You want to help me? If that means I get to have sex with you any time I want, hell yeah. She giggled like a little girl. Good, she said. I just know he's never going to know what happened with him. I couldn't believe this was the woman I had fallen in love with. The witch didn't know it, but she had just declared war, and I swore to give her a war she wouldn't believe. I read the PI report which said Jenny and her lovers often met at the Marriott Hotel downtown at least once a week, and always spent the night at least one weekend a month. Last month, the report said, John had spent an entire weekend with Jenny at my house. Looking at the schedule, I realized those were the weekends I was on my reserve drill. 
I looked at my watch and realized I still had some time before she got home, so I pulled out the card Tracy gave me and called. Law offices of Sally Hawkins, the receptionist said. I introduced myself and made an appointment to see Sally the next morning. After that, I logged into our bank account and did the usual dance one does before a divorce. I paid off and canceled our joint credit cards, then opened a separate account in my name only. I then transferred half of our money into that account. Then I went to my gun safe and pulled out my .45 caliber M1911A1 pistol, still in its holster. I grabbed a fully loaded magazine and inserted it into the pistol grip and attached it to my belt. The state we live in requires a permit to carry a pistol, and I made sure my permit remained current. I also had a concealed carry permit, but rarely took advantage of it. After hearing Ginny and her a-hole lover, I didn't want to take any unnecessary chances. I went into what used to be our bedroom and grabbed a suitcase and an overnight bag. I tossed some of her clothes in the suitcase and put her toiletries in the overnight bag. I really didn't care how I packed her clothes. I set the packed luggage next to the door. I was sitting at my computer when Jenny came home. I activated the camera on my phone, which I always kept in my shirt pocket. The phone was tall enough that the camera lens peeked out over my shirt pocket. She seemed shocked to see me home before her. Mike, what are you doing home so early? She asked, walking into the bedroom that doubled as my office. I had things to take care of, I said nonchalantly. Then she saw the pistol on my hip. Why are you wearing that? She asked. Self-protection, I said. By the way, I have something to show you. Oh, she asked. What? Come on in. You'll find this very interesting, I said. She walked in and stood beside me, looking at the computer. I pulled up one of the video files and played it for her. Her eyes grew wide as she watched herself get drilled by two men. Well, she said. I guess you've caught me. I reckon so, I said. I was a bit surprised by her reaction. I had hoped she would have at least apologized or shed a tear, but she didn't. If anything, she was more arrogant and condescending than normal. I suppose now that you know, there's no need for me to sneak around anymore, she said. So I'll be bringing John by the house from time to time, and yes, he'll be spending the night. In my bed. And yes, you'll watch, and if you're a good boy, I just might let you have sloppy seconds. Too bad, really. I had hoped that we could have kept this from you a bit longer, but I see no need to wait. You're stupid and delusional, which, I said. I had never spoken to her like this before, so she was naturally surprised and taken back. In fact, you'll get your trash and get the hell out, now. What, are you going to file for divorce? She asked. Because if you do, it'll be the biggest mistake of your life. Really? I asked. Why? Are you and your sex buddies going to make shit up about me the way you've done to others? You have no idea what we're capable of, she said. By the time we're finished with you, you may be in jail as a wife beater. And your career in the reserves will be destroyed. We might even plan illegal spicy videos on your computer and make it look like you had a hand in making it. You'd be amazed at what we can do with video editing software. There it was. Go for it. A hole? So that's your plan? I asked. Force me to be your cuck by making up false crap you know is a lie? Why not? She asked. We do it all the time. I'll leave for now, but you think about it real good. I'll give you 48 hours to reconsider. Either go along with the program or get publicly ruined. Wait, I said, reaching for her hand. What, she asked. I ripped her rings off and grabbed her keys out of her purse. What are you doing? She asked as I pulled off the house key. I tossed her purse back to her. Get the hell out, I said. I've already packed some of your shit. Now go. She looked at the luggage by the door then back at me. Come on, Mike, don't do this, she said. Out. I ordered. She picked up the luggage and left. I stopped the video on my phone and reviewed it to make sure I got the entire confrontation. I did. Good. I would make sure Sally saw this tomorrow. I sent the video to my email so I would have it on my PC. From there it went to her parents, her sister, and my parents. I wanted them all to see what Jenny had turned into, and I didn't want her to make me out to be the bad guy in all this. I spent the rest of the night drinking beer and watching TV. After a somewhat sleepless night, I called into work and took a couple of vacation days. I explained what was going on to my boss, and he understood completely. Just take care of things and get back as soon as you can, he said. Thanks, boss, I said, ending the call. After taking a shower, I dressed and headed out to see Sally, making sure I had everything I needed. Sally impressed me with her no-nonsense attitude. She looked at everything I had and simply shook her head. Mike, this is unbelievable, she said. I've heard rumors about Johnson and Associates for years, but 
but I never had anything to back it up. We're looking at serious criminal charges here if what she's saying is true. So, can we do anything with this? I asked. Well, I'll file the divorce on the grounds of adultery and go for a 70-30 to 30 split and no support. We'll give her the usual 30 days to respond with a demand that she produces a full financial report. In the meantime, I'll see about getting a subpoena for her banking records. If she does try to hide the account, we can maybe bring charges of perjury against her. Based on what she said in the video, I'll also get a restraining order against her that covers you, your home, and your place of business, she added. As for the rest, I'll reach out to the state bar and the local DA, she said. This looks like extortion to me. We'll see what comes out of that. In the meantime, you keep your nose clean. Don't confront her, don't speak to her, or anyone who works with her. Stay away from her. Got it. I nodded my head. Got it, I said. Good. I'll get the paperwork started and have her served in the next day or two at her work. Call me on my personal cell if you need to, but don't abuse the privilege. She handed me a card. Thanks, Sally, I said, shaking her hand. That day, I got three phone calls. The first was from my mother. Mike, I'm so sorry about all this. Are you alright? She asked when I answered. I will be, Mom. Thanks. I saw an attorney today and she's taking care of it. Well, you let us know if there's anything you need, Mike. We love you. I love you too, Mom, I said. The next call came from Jenny's parents, who apparently had a hard time understanding basic English. Mike, what the hell is this, he father asked. What did you do? What did I do? I asked, incredulous. You mean, beside love Jenny with all my heart? Nothing. Did you hear what she said? Yeah, I heard it. But I can't believe she'd do something like that without provocation. Can't you just work through this? No, Dad, I can't. I've already seen an attorney and I'm filing for divorce. I'm sorry, son, he finally said. This just doesn't make sense to me. I had to agree. Nothing Jenny did made any real sense. Just please don't hurt my little girl. I won't, I said, ending the call. Her sister also called, and she was pissed. What the hell is going on, Mike? What did you do? I didn't do a goddamn thing. It's your sister who's gone off the deep end, not me. I don't believe it. My sister would never do something like this. Believe what you want. I don't care. I'm just letting you know why I'm divorcing her. You can take it up with her. I ended the call, pissed. I fired up my computer and brought up my email. In my inbox was a message with a subject that read, I know what you've done. I looked at the sender and saw it came from Jenny's firm. The email looked like one of those fake messages that end up in the spam folder. I know what you've been doing and have videos of you masturbating to pictures and video of little girls, the email said. You have 24 hours to stop any divorce action and the files we have will be deleted when you send us a cashier's check for $100,000. If you fail to do this, we will send the files to the authorities, your family, your superiors in the Marine Corps Reserve, and to your place of work. If you agree to this, reply with the word, agree, and we will postpone any further action. The email had no signature. I looked at the header, but didn't see anything that provided any clues. Then again, that wasn't my specialty. I called Bill Frederick, the IT security guy at my company, and spoke with him. Bill, I've got a favor I need to ask of you, I said. Sure, Mike. What's up? Well, it's pretty private. Can you keep this quiet? For you? Absolutely, he said. Okay. I just got an email that looks like it came from my wife's law firm, but I can't confirm it. Can you take a look at this and let me know what you think? Sure. Send it to me, and I'll take a look. I'll know in just a few minutes. Thanks, I said. The call ended. I sent the email to Bill and waited for what seemed like forever. He called back about 30 minutes later. What did you find? Well, it definitely came from Johnson and Associates Network. They didn't even bother to mask it or run it through any proxies. Talk about arrogant. You can verify that? I asked. Absolutely. I can even tell you who wrote the thing. Would you testify to that in court? Sure, if it comes down to that, he said. Thanks, I owe you big time. I'll let my attorney know. She may want to talk to you. No problem, he said. Give her my number. We ended the call and I immediately called Sally. She answered on the second ring. Sally Hawkins, she said. Sally, this is Mike Gregory. I just got an email that looks like blackmail. I had our IT security guy examine it, and he says it came from Johnson and Associates Network. Really? She asked. Okay. I'm working on your petition now and getting the restraining order. Send that email to me and the contact info for your IT guy. We'll take care of this. Don't respond or do anything. 
Okay. Thanks. I ended the call, sent Sally what she asked for then popped open a beer. What the hell was going to happen next, I wondered. I found out later that evening. It was about 9.30 when I got a call from Tracy. Mike, are you watching the news? She asked. No. Why? Turn on Channel 7, right now, she said. Channel 7 was a local news channel and I didn't watch it that much. I changed the channel. To repeat. Eyewitness News is reporting that four people were killed and four others seriously wounded this evening when a gunman entered the Lamplighter Bar and Grill and opened fire on a group of people with what police say was an AR-15 style weapon equipped with a bump stock, the news announcer said. According to reports from eyewitnesses on the scene, the gunman was shot dead by another patron in the bar armed with a pistol. It's not known what, exactly, prompted the shooting, the announcer added. The scene changed and a reporter was talking with a man identified as a witness. It was wild, the man said. This guy came into the bar and went to a table where these people were gathered, then started yelling something about them ruining his life with their lies. He screamed something like, you effers are gonna die. You destroyed me with your effing lies. Then he pulled out this rifle and started shooting. He got a whole bunch of rounds off before another guy shot him in the back with a pistol. Everyone was running, trying to get out. The television went back to the news announcer. Names of the victims are being withheld pending notification of next of kin, but police say they all appear to be employed by the law firm of Johnson & Associates. The gunman has been identified as Roger Spencer, a man said to have gone through a very nasty divorce in which he was reportedly accused of molestation. It is not known where he obtained the weapon used in the attack, but activists are already calling for additional gun control measures. Next on Eyewitness News, a man is reunited with his dog. Damn, I told Tracy. There was a knock on the door. I have to go now, Tracy. Someone just knocked on the door. Same here, she said. Call me if you find anything out. I will, I said, ending the call. I put my phone away and opened the door to find two police officers. Mr. Gregory? One of the officers asked. Yes, I said. Do you know a Jenny Gregory? He asked me. Yes, I do. She's my wife at least for the time being, I said. I'm sorry to inform you, sir, but your wife has been seriously injured in a mass shooting and has been taken to Mercy Hospital, the officer said. How bad is she? I asked. I really don't know, sir, he said. I suggest you talk to the doctor when you get there. Again, I'm sorry, sir. They tipped their hats and left. Damn, I wanted the slimy 304 out of my life, but I didn't want her dead. I called Tracy back. She answered on the second ring, and I could hear her crying. Tracy, this is Mike, I said. What happened? They just told me Jeff, my husband, was shot and killed at the lamplighter, she said. I'm sorry to hear that, Tracy, I said. Damn again, I thought. I had hoped the creep would end up being Bubba's witch, and I felt even worse for Tracy. Jenny was shot also. I'm heading to the hospital to find out what I can. Is there anything I can do for you? We're sniffling. No, but thanks for asking anyway, she said. Please. Stay in touch and let me know what's going on. I will, I told her. We ended the call and I headed to the hospital. The place was crawling with police and reporters with medical staff running around trying to take care of patients. I finally found someone who could give me an answer. Jenny was still undergoing surgery, I was told, but I could stay in the waiting room and someone would come get me. Naturally, I had to fill out several sheets of information about Jenny since she was still on my insurance from work. She had her own insurance, so I figured her treatment should be mostly covered. So here I am at the beginning of my story, wondering if I should just say, screw it, and leave or not. I called Sally to inform her of what had happened. She said she would wait to serve Jenny until she had recovered from surgery. I called Jenny's parents and sister to inform them of what happened. Naturally, they tried to blame me, but I told them that if I had done it, I'd probably be dead and not at the hospital. They came and sat across from me in the waiting room looking at me like I was a pile of dog crap on the ground. I had already been to the cafeteria and wolfed down a piece of chicken and mashed potatoes and drank several cups of bitter coffee, and I had sat here for several hours watching the news. I dozed off more than once while watching the television. It was 5 a.m. when a very tired doctor came to me in the waiting room. Mr. Gregory? He asked. I looked at him with tired, bloodshot eyes. Yes. I asked, rubbing my eyes to stay awake. Jenny's parents and sister came over to us. Your wife is in critical condition right now, but she seems to be stable. We'll know more in the next 24 hours, he said. We removed three bullets from her chest and another bullet grazed her face and damaged her right eye. 
One lung was punctured and another bullet hit her spinal column, but we feel confident she'll survive. The next day or two is critical. Is she awake? Her father asked. The doctor shook his head. No, he said. She's still under from the anesthesia. Just so you know, it's possible she may never walk again and may never recover full sight in her right eye without additional surgery. I'm sorry, he added before walking away. Her father looked at me. So, are you still going to divorce her? He asked. I thought for a moment before answering. One part of me thought about forgiving her, but what she had done was still too raw. Yes, I said. They all looked at me in shock. But I'll wait until she's in stable condition. How could you be so cruel? Her mother asked. How could she be so cruel? I asked. Where will she stay? What will she do? Jenny's mother asked. If my guess is right, that won't be much of an issue, I said. What do you mean? Her father asked. I didn't want to speak out of turn nor did I want to give too much away. We'll see, I said. I'm going home, but I'll be back. I left them standing there and went home, where I showered and fell into bed. By the next day, news of the shooting had spread across the country. Hundreds of men came forward to say that they, too, had been targeted for extortion by the law firm for things they had never done. The stories were eerily similar. Each man had received a threat to reveal some heinous act they had never engaged in unless they paid large sums of money. As a result, many had been ruined for life. State authorities stepped in, arresting a number of lawyers at the firm and the company was forced to cease operations. A massive class action lawsuit was filed against the firm and the partners, seeking millions in damages on top of what the criminal courts ordered. Three days after the shooting, I got word from the hospital that Jenny was awake and asking for me. I called Sally to inform her, and she told me a couple of men would meet me there. One of them, she said, was the process server. I called Jenny's parents and was told one of them had been sitting with her in shifts since her surgery. I met the process server in the hallway outside Jenny's room and another man, who introduced himself as Detective Fulcher. We went into Jenny's room, where she sat in bed. Her mother was in a chair by the wall. Jenny looked at all of us, questions written on her face. Jenny Gregory? The process server asked. She nodded her head. He verified her identity and handed her a manila folder. You've been served, he said before stepping out of the room. Detective Fulcher stood in front of her bed. He looked down at her and shook his head. You do know that extortion and conspiracy to commit extortion is a felony in this state, right? He asked. Jenny looked down and nodded her head. Yes, she said weakly, her voice cracking. And you also know that in this state, the penalty for each act of extortion is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and a $10,000 fine, right? He asked. Again, Jenny nodded her head. He handed her a printed copy of the email I received. Does this look familiar? He asked. She looked defeated. It should. It was composed and sent from your computer under your logon name, along with about 75 others. We found them all in your sent items folder. I'm no scientist, but my math tells me that 76 times 15 years is about 1,140 years. And you're looking at about a $760,000 fine. In short, you're screwed. You know I'm going to have to arrest you. The DA is pushing for a life sentence with all the counts against you. But if you work with us, maybe I can get him to cut you a deal. What do you say? Jenny nodded her head again. Okay, she said quietly. All right, he said. I'll leave you alone with your husband and family for a few minutes, but I'll be back. Detective Fulcher looked at me for a moment, put his hand on my shoulder, and walked out of the room. I looked down at my soon-to-be ex-wife. Tears started falling down her cheek. How could you do this to me? I asked. I've done nothing but love you and respect you. I thought you loved me as well. What the hell happened? I'm sorry, she said through her tears. Her mother grabbed the email and read it, her eyes wide in shock. My God, she said, looking at her daughter. You actually wrote this? To your own husband? Jenny was crying even harder. How could you? I looked at her mother. How do you think Johnson and Associates became so successful? I asked her, rhetorically. They did this to a whole bunch of guys looking for a quick buck. That's why that guy went and shot them all. And I've got her on video admitting that they did this all the time. No wonder you want to divorce her, she said, looking at me. I don't blame you one bit. That, on top of her adultery, I said. There's no way I want her back. Ever. I looked back at Jenny. You never answered my question. She looked at me, defeated. I got wrapped up in the excitement and the power, I guess, she said. As for the letters, well, I was just doing what the lawyers wanted. I hated doing it. And I wasn't the only one. All the paralegals did it as well. Please believe me. I shook my head. I was only following orders. Sorry, 
but that old excuse just doesn't cut it. At all, I said. The snide comments, the disrespect, the cheating. No, you loved it. You got off on putting me down. I saw the glee on your face when you told me you do it all the time. I saw how much you loved putting me down when you were getting drilled by that a-hole. Oh, he's dead, by the way. Nah, you just plain messed up and it almost cost your life. It sure as hell cost you your marriage. I hope it was worth it to you. Can you forgive me? She asked. I shook my head. No, I said. Never. I'm just glad we didn't have any kids. By the way, when you fill out that financial statement, don't forget to include your secret account. You know, the one you set up to hide money from me. I'd hate to see you add perjury to your list of crimes. She looked at me, her eyes wide. You know about that? She asked. I nodded my head. Of course, I said. Who do you think did the year-end books and audit for your firm? You think you've got problems? That's nothing compared to what we found over the last year. Believe me, the feds are gonna have fun with your senior partners. I looked at Ginny one last time. Goodbye, Ginny, I said. I loved you, once. I walked out as Detective Fulcher entered with two uniformed officers. Ginny was handcuffed to the bed as her mother watched in tears. Johnson and Associates was slammed with multiple charges from both state and federal agencies. On top of that, the class action lawsuit for defamation and other civil torts now involved well over 700 men, some of whom had been incarcerated and labeled sex offenders over convictions stemming from the false charges from the firm. The firm and the senior partners were eventually ordered by the court to pay out over $2.5 billion in fines, fees, and restitution, with the lion's share going to the attorneys and the tax man. All of the attorneys with the firm were disbarred, their licenses to practice law suspended for life. For years, debate raged around the divorces handled by the firm. Some said they should all be reviewed, given the circumstances of the scandal. Others said only those involving the men named in the class action should be reviewed. In the end, nothing was reviewed and nothing changed. The partners who survived the shooting ended up getting sentenced to life in prison. Max Johnson, the senior partner in the firm, ate a bullet in his home before his trial was over. Jenny plead out, having turned state's evidence. The judge gave her 20 years in prison and said she would be eligible for parole in 10. She was a shell of her former self when she was released, scarred, blind in her right eye and unable to walk as a result of the shooting. She lived with her parents and collected welfare when her savings ran out. The last I heard, she was writing a blog on the dangers of infidelity, of all things. Jenny's betrayal hit me hard. For some time, I remained something of a hermit, only going on an occasional date. I had real trust issues where women were concerned. Three years after the divorce, I met Carol, a former Marine who also worked as a dispersing clerk. She was about two years younger than me and had just buried her previous husband, who died of a sudden heart attack. We dated several times before I felt comfortable enough to talk to her about my previous marriage. Carol listened quietly as I explained what happened. Once I finished, she nodded her head. That explains a lot, she said. I know it was hard for you to tell me all that but I'm glad you did. You know, not all women are like Jenny. Like you, I believe in the Marine Corps motto, Semper Fidelis. And if you give me a chance, I'll prove it. And she did. Multiple times, and in multiple ways. And she's still doing it, even after all these years. I finally retired from the reserves as a master sergeant, and began collecting my retirement when I hit 55 years of age. Carol and I plan to spend our retirement traveling across the country in a new RV we bought with some of the money I received in the class action against the firm. And Carol tells me she intends to love me to death. I believe her, and I can live with that. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.